but you may want to push them back five or ten minutes. If I do take my time, and, and, and number two, God is always near to us and always around us. When we can't even see it, imagine, imagine this. Imagine living your whole life without a mirror. Imagine living your whole life and you don't know what you look like and you just go through this world kind of uh, in a shadow, so to speak, and, and you don't really know how you appear uh, to others or what you look like yourself until one day you see a mirror and uh, you see something amazing. You see that you have hair, you see that you have beautiful eyes, that you have strong cheekbones. You see that this face that you're looking at kind of looks like others. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 that says this, And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord. The Spirit. You don't see your true self until God puts His mirror of love in front of you. Just like we need a mirror to see our physical appearance, we need the mirror of God's love to see our true selves. To see that we are spirit. To see that we are co-laborers with Christ. To see that we are united with Him, timeless and eternal, and in perfect love with our Creator, with the Father. Have you looked in a mirror lately? This morning, I encourage you. God is bringing His mirror and showing you a reflection of who you really are. And it's amazing. Would you please bow your heads? Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We know that this is a holy day. We know that great things are going to be happening in this place, in our hearts, and in our lives. And so, Lord, right now we turn our attention to you, Jesus. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in this service, Lord, and transform us through your amazing love. Pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you guys please stand as we worship Jesus? Washed linen, how I'll sing thy song. 
sovereign grace. Oh, come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring the promises to pass. And I know that power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. Oh, yes, I know that power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost
Lord, we thank you. We thank you for life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on a cross and giving your life for us to show us the great love of the Father for us, Lord. And we thank you for uh, giving away, Lord Jesus, the keys to, to, to life through your power, through your spirit, so that we are invited in to your presence, into your very being, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we love You and we thank You. And Lord, I pray that You would anoint me to preach this message this morning exactly as You would have it preached, allowing me to say nothing more, nothing less than what You would have spoken. Lord, we pray these things in Your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And... The title of this morning's message is Following the Way, the Truth, and the Life. Following the Way, the Truth, and the Life. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. That's the one verse that we'll be looking at, and then in a few moments we're going to kind of unpack that. But as many of you know, we're now in the season of Lent, right? These are the final 40 days leading up uh, to Easter, leading up to the crucifixion, leading up uh, to resurrection. And so during this time, people will reflect and remember uh, the life of Christ and, and devote themselves uh, to following Him, right? Or to, to seeing Him uh, in a new way, right? And embracing His life and teaching, which is exactly what we're doing with this series, Following Jesus. We're getting down to the historical Jesus and, and what He meant and what He represented and, and, and what He taught, right? And we're looking uh, at what the early believers believed right on the hills of the ministry of Jesus, the apostles, the early church fathers, right? We're looking back through time to find out how we should be living today. And today, Christianity is fragmented. I've been telling you guys that there's over 30,000 denominations of Christianity in the world, and I have to stand up here and say that I've been corrected. There's now 40,000 denominations. 40,000 different belief systems on what it's like and what's required to worship God, to follow Jesus. There's a deep divide, and I don't have to tell you that, this morning, people become very argumentative and combative, right? When you preach upon or croach upon their theological frameworks. Some say that believing in God is believing about facts about God. And, and others say it's not about the belief, it's how you live, right? And, and, and so that we see there's a shift, right? Pick any issue and you're going to find Christians on either side. Some say that evolution is false and it opposes the idea of God. Other Christians embrace science and say that it's just unpacking and, and revealing the very essence of nature itself, right? And so there's all of these different views that's going on. And so basically, bottom line, there's a lot of disagreement about what it means to follow Jesus. And so how we see the story of Jesus matters, right? We're staying in the Gospels because life is too precious, life is too short, life is also eternal. And so we want to get this right, right? And that's what we're going to do here this morning. And so first of all, how we see the story of Jesus really, really matters because in the Gospels it says this about Jesus. He's the Son of God, Messiah and Lord. He's the Word made flesh. He's the light of the world, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the living water, the way, the truth, and the life, the great priest and sacrifice, the Son of Man who will come to gather the elect and judge the world. Christians, Jesus is the perfect reflection or revelation of God. 
He is, uh, as the Bible says, the Word of God made manifest, or manifest right? And, and so we see that, that, that the Bible is a collection of narratives and poetry and words about God, but Jesus shows us God, right? And so when we look at the Gospels, all four Gospels, we need to note three things, right? Three things about the Gospels that will help us understand who Jesus was, who He is, and how we follow Him. And so the first thing about the Gospels uh, is this, that they are a historical account of how the early Christians viewed Jesus. The Gospels were written between 70 and 90 A.D. John being the last, probably closer to 90 Mark being the first, Mark and Luke and then Matthew. They were written in 70 A.D. Jesus, right, was crucified and resurrected, right, about 30 years to 40 years before the Gospels were written. Another thing, right, the Gospels are not written by what we think or by whom we think they are. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we see as you open your Bible, it says the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Luke, the Gospel uh, according to uh, uh, John, right? And so on and so forth. So what this is, it is a collection of an oral history that's been recorded within those communities. No doubt Luke and Mark and Matthew and John passed this information down, right? But it was scribes who wrote it down. That's why it says the Gospel according to. And so these are just some, some basic facts that we've got to see. And the second thing is this. What is written is both how they, how they remember Jesus and also what Jesus meant to them some 30 or 40 years after His life, right? And so we see something very powerful here, not just historical facts or recollections of what Jesus said and done, right? But what He meant to them. When you read the Gospel of John, for example, those are all the I am statements. You see high Christology in the Gospel of John showing us that in the, uh, the Johannian community, right, who people thought that Jesus was, the Son of God, right? And then in Mark, we see a, 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 a different Jesus. In Matthew, we see a Jesus that's connected to the Jewish heritage, right? Different angles of the same person, the same being, but we just got to get this groundwork laid first. So it's a historical account of what people remembered about Jesus and what they viewed or how they viewed Jesus in their lives and in the universe. And third thing, the Gospels are memory and metaphor. Memory and metaphor. All through Scripture you see metaphor, just language like symbolism that, that shows the significance and the meaning of whatever it's pointing to, right? Of whatever is going on. And so, the way, the way of Jesus. John 14, 6 again. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Christians have used this verse uh, throughout history as, as proof text to, to say that you've got to get the names right. You've got to get the words right. Jesus is saying, uh, as we've heard, is that He's standing there and saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. And He most definitely is. But we're missing the point, right? Because we don't know what a way is. We don't know what Jesus is saying. And so throughout Christian tradition, some people have translated or interpreted this verse uh, to say that Jesus is just making a bold declaration about the use of His proper name, right? And which, by the way, Christ was not His last name, His historical Jesus, right? Christ is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Spirit of God poured out into flesh, right? And so we see something very, very powerful here. Do you guys know what a way is? It's a way out, it's a way up, it's a way down. A way is a path. Jesus is saying that I am the way, right? And so we don't stop at the gate and say, okay, the way is Jesus. Jesus is saying something much different. He's saying, 
if you want to follow me, you're going to follow my way. And what is the way of Jesus? The way of Jesus leads to the cross. The way of Jesus leads to death. The way of Jesus leads to death, but then also results in transformation and resurrection, right? John 12, 24 says this. It's the words of Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just as a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so the path that Jesus is talking about is a, is a path of death and, and resurrection. And that way, this path, this path of, of dying to an old way of being, of dying to your old self, of dying to a fear-focused self and reality that you were, to a, a everything-is-mine mentality, to I've got to win at all costs mentality, to where I've got to be number one mentality that has to die and out of that comes a spirit of humility and grace and love this is the way of Jesus the way of Jesus and this way of dying to the old and being resurrected to the new right is known throughout all of the world through all of ancient times right the way of Jesus is the universal way you can't pass it regardless of where or when you were born right you can't go over top of it right because Jesus is the universal way known to millions in the world this is a truth and if a truth is a truth it's a truth everywhere and for all time I I know I should probably slow down this morning, but I feel like I'm on fire, right? The truth is all-encompassing, right? And so what Jesus is saying to all of us as humans is the way to life goes through death. Multiple cultures have understood this. Have you guys ever, let's just talk openly this morning. Have you, ever, have you ever wondered how people, for example, who lived in North America in, in times of B.C., before Christ, the Native Americans, for example, how they lived here in America, they lived and they died and they never ever heard the gospel. They never ever read a Bible. They never ever heard the name of Jesus. And so what does that mean? Let's be honest. Let's be honest, if we think that Jesus is saying the way, the truth, and the life is knowing and memorizing my name and spelling it correctly, then they missed it. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what Jesus is saying, right? Uh, it, God has dealt with all of humanity throughout all of time, some 12,000 years of human civilization, right? The Bible's been around, covers a, a cultural group uh, for about 5,000 years, the Hebrew people and, and the early Christians, right? And so what does God do with all of those people? For example, the, the Native Americans. What does God do with other groups in Africa, South America? Well, the Bible tells us what He does. Romans 1.20 says that He has revealed His characteristics through all time, to all people, through His creation. And so God is revealing Himself to the world, right? This is the way. This is the way of God. And this truth is everlasting. And so let's think about it for just one second. Did God in heaven say this? Did He just put aside and discard all those millions of people until he got to the Baptist. Did he just put aside and get rid of all of those people? He's just waiting for the Lutherans to emerge in the 1500s. Did he say, no, I've created some beautiful people and some fascinating civilizations, but they don't gain entry into eternity until uh, they pronounce the name of Jesus. No, God deals with his people independently, privately, collectively, and truthfully, right? God has a way of reconciling everything together. This is what the Bible says tells us that He has revealed Himself to all mankind, and therefore man is without excuse. I 
Isaiah 65.1. Isaiah 65.1 says this. What I'm saying is the way of Jesus is not just a set of beliefs about Jesus. It's much deeper than that. Isaiah 65.1, this is God speaking. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask. To be found by those that did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that did not call on my name. Let's think about that. Let's read it again. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that did not call my name. So in other words, to a people that didn't even call themselves Christians, to a people that didn't even call themselves followers of Yahweh. This is literally in sacred scripture. It's God saying that I've moved out beyond the the Hebraic people and your understanding to a people group outside of your camp. And this people group don't even call themselves by my name, but I am ready to be found by them. Yet we got to say, and we circle the wagons and say, no, if you're not in our tribe, you don't belong to God. This is scripture, this is good preaching, this is truth. Words do not save us, it's dying to our egos. Dying to ourselves, dying to our need to be right. And and, and, and placing our belief in Christ is what saves us. Not placing our belief in facts about Christ. Not placing our beliefs in statements about Christ. That's not even belief according to the Bible. Belief is trusting in someone. It's laying all of your commitment and your trust into the divine, into God, not knowing all the answers and the certitudes and the right things to say or do. You just trust God because you believe Him to be the one who has created it all and holds it all together. It's not academic. It's not just believing a doctrinal statement or a creed or anything like that. We've reduced it down to mere mental agreement, something that's supposed to be transformative, something that's supposed to be powerful and life-giving. Instead, we've sucked the life dry out of it by trying to define, seclude, sequester people and make everybody believe our own ideas about God. The way of Jesus is the way of death and resurrection. The path of transition and transformation. From an old way of being to a new way of being. Jesus said you'll be able to tell the tree by by the fruit that it bears. The fruit that we bear should not be intellectual superiority or self-righteousness or I've got it all right in my head and if you don't, you're going to burn in hell. What is that garbage? It needs to leave the very echoes of our mind and of our mouths. Let's see Jesus in a more truthful way that He says, everybody who wants to, come on down, right? It's the path of descent. It's the path of suffering. The path of sorrow. The path of holding together everything and you don't quite understand it. And through that, somehow, through the death, life, new life emerges. This is the way that Jesus is talking about. Now, what about the truth and the life? Jesus was fully God and fully human. Fully God and fully human. He's the incarnation, right? But listen to this. He is the perfect incarnation. The full incarnation. But let's step back for just a minute. Let's step back to Genesis 1. Let's step back to the abyss, to the darkness, to the void, to the quietness. 
the nothingness, the space of nothingness. And then all of a sudden, right, we have creation. We have the Big Bang where stars come into visibility, where gases erupt and form worlds, right? This is the initial incarnation of God taking spirit into matter, right? That's exactly what creation is. It's God saying, I am making myself manifest. I am making myself manifest for relationship, right? And out of that, the world is created and man is created and and there's a truthfulness to the fact that God is everywhere. The very substance that's in our bodies, the molecules, the atoms that are within us are the same that's shared by the stars, the the, the eyes uh, uh, and the trees, uh, the snow, the rain. Can you see the beauty of God in everything? We don't have to define the sun in order for it to rise every day. It rises because God causes it to rise. We don't have to know the gravitational pull of the sun in order to get it to rise. And so we see that, that, that God uh, has manifested Himself in all uh, of the universe, right? And, and one thing, this is why this is important. We can say this, and let me say it clearly, right? The one foundational and revolutionary ideal in the Bible is that God manifests Himself in the ordinary. That God reveals Himself to ordinary people. He does not hold out for the pure of the pure. He does not hold out, right, for the spiritual. He does not hold out until somebody gets the right idea about anything. No, in the Bible, God uses the wounded lives of everyday people. He doesn't just hold back until uh, somebody gets it right before He intervenes in their life, right? He's incarnate all uh, around them, right? And many of the people that God used in the Bible would not pass our test for ministry today. Those whom God has used in the Bible would fail at the deaconship class if there is such a thing. They would fail in the path of ordination, right? They would fail in getting the tenets of the faith correct. Every single one of them, right? And who do we think we are that we've set ourselves up in our theological ivory towers determining who gets it right, who's got it wrong, right? When God the whole time He has dealt with humanity has moved towards those who are broken, who don't get it right, who cannot even imagine getting it right. He moves towards them and does great and wonderful things. Let's name a few. Moses, Deborah, right? Elijah, Paul, and Esther were at least complicit in murder. David was both an adulterer and a liar. And we have an entire history of ridiculously evil kings and and warriors. Yet, Yet these are all the ones that God works through, right? They are not dismissed because their theology is incorrect. Saying something very powerful here this morning. Think about this. God's revelations are, are concrete and they're specific. When God reveals Himself to the world, it's not a set of conceptual ideas or religious theories about what can be right or about what can be wrong. Revelation is not something we can reduce into an equation or a formula. Revelation is not anything we can measure. Revelation is a person. Revelation is Jesus Christ, right? This is the mystery of incarnation. This is the mystery of incarnation. And here's the mistake that we make. Here's the mistake that we make. Our our temptation is to trust our faith tradition in trusting God more than our trust in God Himself. We link our faith upon our traditional ways of understanding God or believing God instead of linking our faith to God Himself. A very, very big difference, right? And so we talk about people in the past, how God has moved through them, and that's great to remember that. But oftentimes, when that's all that we do, we miss God in the present moment. We miss God in the present moment, right? We miss Him 
all around us, right? And so incarnation means embodiment, right? So here we go to conclude before we get to two quick examples, right? Jesus is the way, right? The way of the cross which leads to death and then resurrection. So Jesus is what the way embodied looks like, right? And Jesus is what the truth embodied looks like, right? And Jesus is life itself, what it's embodied and looks like. The way, the truth, and the life. Now, the request for power. Turn to Mark chapter 10. We've seen here that Jesus has given us the way and the truth and the life, right? But, but let's look at a couple of disciples that spent uh, three years at least, probably three and a half years with Jesus. And let's see how quick on the uptake they are about getting what He's telling them. Mark chapter 10, verse 37 and 38. This is James and John, right? The inner circle. The bros of Jesus. The closest of the closest. The ones on the in-group. And they said to Him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drank or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So Jesus and His disciples are on their way to the holy city. They're heading to Jerusalem where Jesus uh, would spend His last week where He would be crowned King of the Jews, right? He would be crucified, right? And James and John are eager to promote themselves in His kingdom. They think that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to turn things upside down. And He did more than that. But they're only looking at the physical. They think that Caesar's power is going to fall. They think that Rome's grip on their life is going to fall, right? And they're asking Jesus, perhaps, can I be your Secretary of Defense and your Secretary of State? Jesus, I see you on the crescendo, climbing to the top, and please take me with you. I want to serve and lead on your right. I want to serve and lead on your left. I know everybody else who's out there, right? And I can determine who's right, who's wrong, right? I can determine who's the least and who's the greatest. And notice what happens. Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. You don't know what you are asking, right? Because who is on Jesus' right and left? Thieves. Revolutionaries that were crucified right beside Him. James and John were unknowingly asking Jesus to be crucified themselves right next to Him. In their quest for power, they had no idea the way of Christ, right? Uh, and, the, and the way of Jesus is not the way of worldly power, right? They couldn't compute this. They couldn't understand this. They knew that Jesus was the King of kings, right? But their view of kingsmanship is to rule out and to reign from a place of power. But the way of Jesus is powerlessness. The way of Jesus is co-suffering with love. Right? And so they ask this and Jesus tells them they don't even know what they are asking for. Caesar conquests the kingdom through power. Christ through sacrificial love. So we think of love as a mere sentiment, a mere emotional feeling, a, a, a greasy, gracie kind of love that's lollipops and, and cordial and, and soft. And we think of violence as power. We think of ruling with an ironclad fist as power, right? Yet the whole life and ministry of Jesus is a rebuke of this lie, right? The kingdom of God is a kingdom of love, not domination. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of love, not denomination or domination. And we persuade by our witness and by our love and by the Spirit, right? There's no such thing as a Christ like Caesar. No such thing as a Christ like Caesar. Christ gives his life away 
for the good of others. Caesar takes the good of others so that he can be more comfortable himself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to check ourselves this morning. Are we following the way of Jesus or are we in the way? Are we following the way of Jesus or are we standing in the way perhaps of somebody else that doesn't quite get it right from getting to Jesus because we're standing in the path and we're saying, no, you've got to do this, you've got to believe that, you've got to do this, jump through this hoop. Are we in the way or are we following the way? Laying down our lives for the good of others. Last story, Matthew chapter 4. The temptation of good ideas. Talking about the way, the truth, and the life this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read a familiar story with most of you. I know that you're, you recognize this story, but I'm going to read through these 11 verses quickly. Matthew chapter 4. Now, I'm not going to read them quickly. My mom said, take your time and slow down, so I'm going to slow down we got plenty of time. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. So Jesus, uh, just being baptized by John the Baptist, right? Just baptized by John the Baptist. Scripture says that the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness, right? So just because you're going through a trial doesn't mean that you're out of line with God's will for your life. If the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, He can do the very same for you, right? And so that's point number one. Don't take it as a put down just because you're going through a trial, right? This could be for a purpose to cultivate something in your lives. But notice something about this story, right? When Jesus gets into uh, the wilderness, notice that the devil doesn't come to him with horns and a pitchfork and a red cape. In fact, the devil comes to Jesus like he does to us a lot of times. Disguised as our own thoughts. Disguised as as a friend when he's in fact an adversary. Disguised as our own beingness, right? Our own desires, which are not ours. The devil is sending them. This is what's going on here. It's an eternal truth, right? The devil did not tempt him with evil. He tempted him with good. He didn't throw out before Jesus just some promiscuity, promiscuous type of activity. He throw out before Jesus some, some debaucherous time that he could have. No, everything that he throws out to Jesus is good. You have ears, listen, listen to what's being said this morning, right? Allow the truth of God to land within your life wherever it needs to land this morning. I can't give you a prescription for every detail that you're going through, but the Holy Spirit can. And this morning He's speaking to you. 
Jesus was presented with a temptation, but they all seemed like great ideas, right? But Jesus knew that the devil's in the details. Jesus knew that the devil was in the fine print, right? And so the first temptation, right, for bread, it's the first temptation uh, to feed everyone but forget about God. It's the temptation to take care of everybody, but forget about God. For our lives, it means this. We can't just be focused on social justice alone without first having an idea or a love for God, right? We cannot love our neighbor. Yes, Jesus said to do that, but Jesus also said, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. There's something about being tied into the very reality of Christ, being grafted into His very being that results in fruit that's out for social justice purposes or for the benefit of those in society, right? And so the first principle that we've got to see, it seems good to feed everyone, but we cannot do it unless we depend on God. They're inseparable, right? And so Jesus notices that, right? He will multiply the fishes and the loaves, but He also invites us to the path or the way of the cross. The second temptation is to persuade everybody. The second temptation is to persuade everybody, right? And it says that He took Him to the holy city and placed Him on the pinnacle, uh, saying to Him, pinnacle of the temple, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written that He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up. You will not dash your foot against the stone, right? This is the temptation to prove God either by miracles or by science, but without faith, right? This is the temptation to prove God academically and theologically, but not having real faith in God. This is the temptation to go to seminary and to learn about all the theologians, right? And to get down uh, all of the creeds and the, the councils and, and to put that before. I'm not saying that that is wrong at all. I went to seminary, right? So I'm preaching to myself first. Please understand that. But the point of following Jesus is not to acquire a new set of intellectual concepts. No, we lean on faith to persuade others. Not on our own vocal ability or vocabulary or mental ideas. We lean on God to transform others. I need to say that again. The transformation that occurs in the lives of people is not because we've got it all together right and can say it correctly. The reason that people are transformed is because of the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God. And the third temptation, this is the most subtle of all, right? It's the temptation to liberate everybody but, and kill the bad guys. It's the temptation, right, to, to liberate everybody, to set everybody free and, and to kill the bad guys. That's what's going on. The devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to them, and said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, imagine all the kingdoms of the world. Imagine you, if you had the opportunity opportunity and you were a king of the world imagine the injustices that you would see and that you would want to take care of all right imagine all the oppression all the poverty all the war and sickness that's in the world and if we roll out as king of this world what we're going to do is take a, a tank with us so to speak we're going to take an arsenal with us right and some of that is okay because you want to see at least in your mind that evil is dealt with that justice is carried out, right? But what God, what Jesus is showing us right here is that there's a better way. It's the way of the cross. It's the path of descent. It's the, it's the path of giving your life away, right? And so Jesus can't be reduced down to an agenda. Jesus is not left wing. Jesus is not right wing. Jesus has His own agenda. And His own agenda is this. It's just. It's peaceable. And most of all, it worships God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this morning, I wonder, 
Like I said earlier, are you in the way or are you on the way? Because the way is full of good news, right? The way is not only the path of descent, but the way is also reflective of the love that God has for everyone. It's reflective of the love that that Christ has for us all, right? And, And so we see something very, very powerful, right, in the life of Jesus. We see that He has us surrounded. We see that the very breath that we breathe is the very breath of God. We see that that the way of suffering, right, leads to transformation. We see also that sin is what happens before salvation, right? That sin leads up up to the salvation of God's people. Salvation being referred to as something in the past, present, and the future. And Scripture says that God has reconciled all people unto Himself, right? That all people will be saved, right? And so what are we going to do? Are we going to stand on the sidelines, stand at the front gate, and decide who gets in, who gets out, right? And this is not a free pass for sin. Sin will bring hell to your life. Sin will bring death to you. But what I'm saying here is a universal truth that God holds it all together, right? And can we believe that God is that good? Can the good news possibly be that God has invited us all to the table and that God loses no one, right? Could that be the good news? Or would we rather people be sent to hell? And if we would rather that, why? That's the question. And so this morning as we think about the presence of God, as as we think about life in God, right? We trust God that He works out salvation and with us co-laboring together, right? The name of God. I'll say this once more as Amanda comes up to prepare our final worship song. Remember in the Old Testament, remember the name of God, right? It's Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God. And it's a name that was so holy, so special, that it could not be written, right? It could not even be said out loud. You couldn't say Yahweh. And so they translated His name, left out the vowels, right? Y-H-V-H, which is how when it got into English, the word Jehovah comes about. That actually is just a mistranslation for the name of God, which is Yahweh. Way, Yahweh, so holy that it couldn't be spoken, but it could be breathed. The very idea of God bringing into manifestation this universe is the idea that God Himself has given us all an essence of Himself within us, right? A divine code, so to speak. A divine presence that we all have, right? It's like a, it, all, it comes, the Spirit comes with the manufacturer. Right, we all have it, and and the ancient traditions of, uh, of following Jesus was about pulling this up, this this power, this spirit that God has given us all, right, to 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 give our devotion to God and, and to pull up, to let our bodies and our being be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, we all have access to this. And and to further uh, support this idea, the Hebraic issue or focus or practice of God's name could only be breathed. It's Yah on the in-breath, Way on the out-breath. So it's Yah-Way. Yah-Way. He's here. He's here. He's inside. And the way of Jesus says, will you descend so that you can transcend? You're not far off from God. He's got you. We just need to open our eyes and see. Yeah. Guys, please stand across the sanctuary. Altars are open this morning if you want prayer. When I walk through deep water, 
I know you will be with me. When I'm standing in the fire, I will not be overcome. Through the valley of the shadow, no, I will not fear. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You will go before me, and you will never. breaking through the dark of night will not not overtake me as I am pressing into you Lord you fight my every battle so Cause I'm not alone, I'm not alone, you will go before me, and you will never leave me, I'm not alone, no, I'm not alone, you will go before me, and you would my strength, you're my defender, you're my refuge from the storm, and through these trials you've always been faithful, you bring healing to my You will never leave me. I'm not alone. No, I'm not alone. Cause you will go before me. I know you would never leave me. And I'm not. 